Day three of Suboptic 2019 opened with keynote speaker Amber Case, a cyborg anthropologist. This technology researcher specializes in examining the interaction of humans and their technology, a key insight for an industry that creates the bandwidth that modern equipment utilizes. Her concepts of calm technology advocate a less complex and automated approach to engineering user-friendly devices. I spoke on the concept of calm technology, which is from Xerox Park in the 80s and 90s. The idea is that Technology is no longer scarce, it's our attention that's scarce, and how technology makes or breaks our attention makes or breaks that technology. So I had a series of principles on how you could make technology that works with us instead of against us, and how to amplify the best of humans and the best of technology without trying to make a future in which it was all automated and people were bored, or all human and uh, no technology. So humans working alongside machines and machines working alongside humans. Following the keynote, Tim Strong and Alan Malden of Telegeography addressed some of the common myths about the internet. As the morning content concluded, oral presentations for the day began. Topics on the third day covered issues like best contracting practices and project management, fault identification and management, the changing relationship between data centers and cables, and advancements in fiber manufacturing. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about the markets right now in the African region? Yes, um, it's interesting that Africa is indeed represented by a few parties at this conference. And over the past 10 years, we have witnessed a growth in the number of submarine cables serving both coasts of the continent. So on our west coast, for example, there are now seven um, submarine cable systems and um, the majority of countries on the coast have direct access um, to several of those cables. In Nigeria we have access to five which is a tremendous improvement. Um, so it's been a couple of years. Um, a lot of the effort in our markets remain building out infrastructure to distribute that capacity and get it closer to the eyeballs. But at the same time, we're able to take advantage of some of the new technologies, spectrum sharing, um, to make capacity on our cables available to some of the other countries that were not previously connected, building out branching units to additional countries. And we continue to see exponential increase increases in terms of what's going on. I'm here with Frederico Grasso, one of our speakers on the third day of Suboptic 2019. He's here to talk a little bit about his paper uh, on AI learning and how it can be applied to sub uh, to uh, subsea cable. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's a novel approach, uh, even though not, pio not, not exactly pioneering, because uh, other people have tried to apply uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to, uh, to automate that analysis. But I believe it's the very first attempt to apply this same approach uh, to analyze the statistics about uh, submarine cable faults. And my approach described a method uh, that I will publicly disclose as a and, um, open source software in Python to, to try to analyze the submarine cable faults. Do you see this method uh, really being used later on, maybe when you have more access? Yes, I hope so. In my talk, uh, I address this topic precisely because uh, I would like to automate uh, the gathering of data by using automating data on the SLTs or built-in TDRs so we can also access those minor faults on submarine cables which are not targeted for an actual repair. And there are so many. They just go unnoticed because we don't know anything about that. I poise that we um, automate the entire process uh, of um, uh, collecting the data. Was there any specific takeaways you were hoping your listeners had today? Yes, I just hope that the various agencies uh, are listening to the topic. I believe that um, the submarine cable forecasting and the prevention and mitigation should be a cooperative effort. Uh, so that uh, everyone must cooperate, uh, everyone should share the information they have about the faults, uh, so we can all together cooperate and uh, avoid uh, as many faults as we can. Hi, I'm with Philippe Perrier of GlobeNet, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his paper, Virtualizing the Subsea Network. Philippe, what does yes. virtualizing mean in this case? Well, in this case, uh, virtualization of the network means uh, or comes about uh, because of two trends which uh, we have uh, observed in the past 
uh, in the past few years uh, on the subsea network. The first uh, trend is uh, the open cable systems, uh, where the SLTs uh, are disaggregated from the wet plant. And the second, uh, the second trend is uh, the massive uh, uh, capacity that can be offered by uh, fiber on each fiber pair uh, due to the advances in, um, in uh, transmission technology such as uh, uh, coherent detection, uh, uh, digital signal processing and, um, and uh, uh, advanced modulation format for instance. So the combination of these two trends um, uh, allows uh, the cable owners uh, to develop a new business model that we call uh, spectrum partitioning. And in the case of spectrum partitioning, uh, a customer can be allocated part of the uh, partition of the spectrum or uh, 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 slice of the spectrum. And uh, it can manage, uh, each customer can manage uh, depending on the configuration uh, of the uh, shared uh, spectrum or uh, spectral partitioning, can manage its own spectrum without having to uh, communicate with, um, uh, with a cable owner. So. So what side of the industry do you see this having the most impact using this new kind of business model? So pretty much, uh, I mean, uh, the capacity per fiber pair now is such that um, uh, you don't have a customer or the customers uh, that will require the full bandwidth of, a, of a fiber pairs are, are very limited. So um, uh, there is an interest from the cable owner uh, into a spectrum uh, partitioning because it allows them to offer part of the spectrum to customers uh, who might uh, need only uh, a fraction of the, of the spectrum. Uh, and from the customer point of view, uh, it's also par spectrum partitioning is also interesting because it allows uh, them to have direct access to the fiber plant without investing into a, a, into a fiber pair. Hi, I'm here with Vinay Nagpal with Interglobix who is here to talk a little bit about his paper on the convergence of terrestrial, subsea, and uh, uh, subsea fiber and data centers. Vinay, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, presentation? Sure, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, so the paper I presented uh, is in the convergence of data centers, uh, subsea fiber and terrestrial fiber. Uh, and it uh, talks about um, the various aspects of data centers uh, for the subsea industry to be looking at when they're evaluating um, a third-party data center provider to land a subsea cable in, uh, and also for the data center industry to be working more closely hand-in-hand -hand with the subsea industry uh, from the standpoint of landing subsea cable into a carrier-neutral uh, co-location data center. Where do you see this taking the, uh, the convergence and the interconnectivity of these three aspects later in the future? Yeah, um, Stephen, uh, there are various uh, parts around the world where we see this convergence taking place, uh, where you see either a subsea cable landing happening in a carrier neutral co-location data center or a data center operator working closely with the subsea industry uh, to even at times build that subsea co-location ecosystem. And uh, I think where it's headed is, is a natural convergence, which is where you see um, a subsea co-location ecosystem being developed where you have the subsea cable, terrestrial uh, cable, uh, terrestrial fiber networks uh, giving the subsea industry the option to uh, hand off the traffic to uh, various different terrestrial routes, have ability for their customers to colo in the same carrier neutral facility with space, uh, power, and cross connects. Um, and then uh, thirdly, with also having kind of internet exchange points and SDN providers who would um, build their own uh, networks um, on top of that foundational layer to uh, make the overall value proposition more attractive for the end customer. Do you see any of the larger operations doing something maybe a little more turnkey where they're going to be including uh, in their pl uh, design plan either two or even all three of these aspects? Yeah, I think for uh, the larger projects slash the OTTs, if that's what you're referring to, I mean, at the end of the day, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that they are the consumers of, their, of the bandwidth themselves. So their primary goal is to uh, connect their cloud platforms uh, and or hyperscale data centers uh, across continents to connect them together. Along the way, um, they would want to optimize uh, um, and, and achieve economies of scale in terms of uh, not just subsea but terrestrial fiber routes as well where it makes the most economic sense for them. Uh, and I think uh, we'll see 
the OTTs and hyperscalers driving this phenomena for their own specific requirements. And then you see the independent infrastructure providers or the new age subsea operators who are partnering with a couple of different companies coming together to, uh, to take advantage of, um, of this new global trend. Industry peers later came together in roundtable discussions that explored the multiple challenges facing the industry now and in the future. Volunteer moderators facilitated discussions at several tables to bring the various minds of the industry together. Finally, attendees cut a colorful rug down Canal Street in Suboptic 2019's very own Mardi Gras parade, accompanied by a float, revelers, and a local marching band playing New Orleans jazz. The parade ended at Antoine's restaurant, where the Mardi Gras Gala was held. A city icon, Antoine's is more than 175 years old and is known as one of the finest restaurants in North America. The gala featured a 1920s speakeasy-style jazz band, traditional Creole cuisine, and multiple themed rooms such as a cigar rolling room, a bourbon room, and a voodoo room. This gala, a unique experience in the history of Suboptic, left some guests reminiscing of Suboptic in Versailles. Is it easy to establish business operations in Bermuda? Well, yes. If you've got a great idea and the ability to deliver it, then you will get through the process very quickly. You know, when you're looking at places to do business, you look at what's the infrastructure, you look at what's the regulatory environment, and you look at how you can really be innovative and what that success is. There's a very strong and diverse population that allows us to access legal talent, regulatory, banking, financial, all of which are very important for a company like ours in order to scale and grow quickly. When we decided to move to Bermuda, it was truly due to the fact that the proximity to the U.S. was very important to us. It's very important to have staff and, and the workforce in place that's highly educated. We have an enabling environment for the free flow of financial capital and also high quality intellectual capital. Uh, the prospects for innovation are extremely uh, bright in Bermuda. And I think it's really important that Bermuda has that infrastructure that allows companies to be innovative, to grow, and to really meet their business needs. We're able to get our products to market extremely quickly. We do not have to follow in 52 different states. And that is extremely critical in terms of the speed with which we can provide solutions. The way liabilities covered in the United States had its genesis here. The way natural catastrophes are covered globally had its genesis here. The way capital gets deployed in our business has been evolving, and that evolution had its genesis here. So that's innovation. We want to embrace more companies from the U.S. and Europe to come to, uh, to Bermuda. Anyone considering to come to the island, especially in the biotechnology sector, I think it's a go. The Bermuda marketplace is world class. It's world class in the people, it's world class in the capital that it has, it's world class in its regulatory environment, and it's a world-class environment just generally. Our whole business is about talent. Reinsurance equates to a pool of capital managed by a talented team. Without the talented team, the capital is worthless. Bermuda is one of the handful of global financial centers of reinsurance and the only place in the world where high school kids know that reinsurance actually is a rock star job, is the perfect place to find and retain talent for our space.